the Warner Music, which is in the process of buying EMI, uh, and for all of us guys who remember LPs, you know, those, those labels mean something, holding up the record and going, oh, you know. Uh, so EMI is getting acquired by, by Warner Music. But simultaneously, Warner Music has hired Goldman Sachs to shop itself and sell itself. So it's as, I mean, this is an industry that's in such disarray. They, they, I don't think they have any clue long term how they're going to create value. And I really wonder who would buy Warner Music Group. You know, I mean, you guys in the audience here probably know a lot more about me than the music industry, but it's not obvious to me. Uh, the revenues there, you can't really lever them up. Because to have leverage, you need to have reliable cash flows, which they don't have. Warner was such a potent and powerful label in the 60s and 70s and 80s that I would bet that the buyer that sets up will be someone nostalgic for the experience that uh. they had. <laughs> yeah, the nostalgia factor actually is is real when, when people are buying companies. Uh, I mean... I'm, I mean, Wall Street Journal is a, is a great asset, but I actually think uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch bought that company a lot of because of what he thought of the Wall Street Journal as this iconic property, so much the same way people buy um, sports teams. They, they may not be profitable in the long term, but wow, what a, what a great trophy to own. Right. You're right. Newsweek sold for a dollar? Newsweek, right. Right, Newsweek sold for a dollar. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, but there was 70, <laughs> 70 million of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, and Newsweek, let's face it, that wasn't exactly one of the top names you, that would jump to your mind when you think about great American names. Can I ask one Apple question? <coughs> uh, there's one thing that always confuses. Uh, I was working with Next when I worked for Reuters. We were going to be making a big purchase for their workstation. And he had the best automated factory in the world. I mean, and it was his design. He's a genius about automated why is Apple creating a competitor in lots of time when Steve Jobs knows how to make a factory with no people in it? Yeah, you guys heard that question? Yeah, you know, Foxconn is the outsource manufacturer, contract manufacturer for so Apple. They're funding a company in LA to try to compete with Apple's <coughs> branding because they want to kick their ass. So, I you know, what I would say to you, uh, I, I don't know if everybody heard the question, but, but, but summarizing, uh, Apple has a bunch of partners. Some of those partners, it's teaching how to do things that historically were competitive advantages to Apple. And I would say that is the great conundrum that all companies are going to have to deal with in the next 10 or 20 years when it comes to outsourcing and, uh, and, and dealing with even, even the concept of cloud computing. You are giving up a little bit of your DNA when you work with a partner. Now, of course, what you hope is in the long run that partner can make you more profitable because you can manage your balance sheet and all their stuff better. Yeah, but I'm hearing this as a big issue. Who here outsources? Raise your hand. Only a few. That's surprising. And a lot of people are concerned. I, I actually think if you own a company, you you think about it. You outsource. There is something you outsource. I don't know what it is. Well, let me put it differently. Janitorial? Question. I mean, you outsource. So how many of you offshore is probably a better statement? Okay, offshore. Okay. More hands went up. Wow. Well, because the, the, the term. And a lot of companies are concerned, especially around India, there's nothing secure. Once you send it to them, your IP or whatever your tool sets are, you don't know if that's going to stay inside their little vault or it's going to leak out. So now we're starting to see a lot of things that have been offshore popping up in other development tools of other companies. Yeah. And that's, that, that brings up a big, big fear. Yeah. And you yeah. said that was a uh, hundred and eighty thousand employees. Yeah, it took half an hour to ride a golf cart from one side of the plant to the other. Wow, that's amazing. So when everybody wonders where U.S. manufacturing jobs are going, <laughs> one hundred and eighty thousand employees. Next. Yeah.
so she well, of course. Yeah. 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 So we were trying to set up supply chain systems and they didn't want to do half the things that everybody else had because they didn't have to. Yeah. Two other things about the uh, the Chinese uh, uh, president's visit that I thought was worthwhile noting. What you just described, you know, the this concept of U.S. offshoring jobs to China. Uh, I, I've said this many times. I, I I really believe it. At one point, Alex will provide me the data to support it, uh, which is that betting on manufacturing jobs to grow our economy this century is a fool's errand. Well, I'll give you a statistic right now that'll that'll answer that. Our manufacturing Right, and and I mean the the idea that we should preserve those jobs in order to maintain a standard of living. I mean, my view is just that you could only do that if there were every other country in the world w didn't have people willing to work at wages that are a fraction of the U.S. wages. We have to do something else. But what 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 got me was so much of the discussion that uh, uh, the news reported on about. Uh, President Obama and President Hugh discussing economic matters was around how the U.S. can preserve its manufacturing jobs. And I just think that's, that's a silly thing because in China, the Chinese are already seeing that they have to deal with Bangladesh and Vietnam. There is always another country who will work for less. That sounds like a good uh, op-ed you should write yeah, in the New York Times, <laughs> Alex. Uh, they go to Max. 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 Related to all that, I heard already the other day that uh, Apple, you know, all the stuff that's, that's assembled in China for Apple, uh, which the bulk of the components are actually created here, but they're shipped to China, and then that, that's treated in the trade balance mm. as an import from China. Yeah. So, so, so there's an issue here about how are we actually And Max, what you're talking about, which I think is could be a, an interesting discussion all in itself, but is this idea of when you read numbers about trade, about inflation, about economic growth, about uh, current account balances, most of them are complete bullshit, uh, and they, they don't make sense. What what you're talking about with the with the iPod? It was the iPod or the, the iPhone? iPhone? It was the iPhone. It was the iPhone. dollars in manufacturing costs is the real cost on Apple's balance sheet <coughs> of what they pay for the actual assembly and manufacturing in China. But yet the entire value of the iPhone, the $600 plus average price of all iPhones, is actually recognized as China trade. Right. Versus the real real sink of that value, which is at Apple and Cupertino. That's amazing. Yeah, so you know, look at these numbers with a real skeptical eye. A uh, couple of other things I wanted to, uh, to talk about. Uh, Goldman Sachs, I think this happened last week, but this week it, it got a little bit more colorful. Goldman Sachs raising a billion to a billion five for Facebook at a 50 billion valuation. I think you guys all were. Uh, 70 billion now on SharePoint. Right. That, by the way, this is, that's, that, well, I'll get to that. That's an interesting point, too. Already the $50 billion valuation is a, is a steal because, as it turns out, on Shares Post, which is the private auction market for, for shares, it's it's uh, actually it's up it's up over seventy billion. Uh, the it's a website, what, right? It's a website <laughs> for sharing pictures. It's an app. It's an app. Yeah, it's it's an app. It's an app that makes a lot of good money, but still, it's an app. Uh, I I bring that up because uh, th to me this is just one of those strange things. How Goldman Sachs couldn't have realized that the problem, by the way, was they they realized after they announced all this that they are going to be in violation of a lot of SEC regulations if they raise money from U.S. investors. But they're not. They're selling it to all foreign investors. And so now, and so they said, oh, you know what? Sorry, clients. We're only going to sell it to foreign investors now. But this is Goldman Sachs. I mean, you have a couple of lawyers there. You should be able to figure that out. <laughs> I, I, 
It's just so, and, and the funny thing is, I remember Brock Pierce a year and a half ago mentioning this whole concept to me of, hey, start a fund, buy a bunch of private shares in Facebook, and then sell them to people who just don't have the ability to, to access them. And in our conversation, he said, you know, but I, I guess we'd be in violation of the securities laws, so we probably couldn't do that. Uh, Goldman Sachs couldn't figure that one out. Uh, that's the Goldman Sachs MO, isn't it? Break the law, pay a small fine, and make a huge profit. Yeah, well, on that point. On that point about Goldman, and I, I hate to kick, uh, kick them all the time, but they just deserve it. Uh, <laughs> so the Treasury Department, formally run by the former president of Goldman Sachs, right, Hank Paulson. Uh, the Treasury Department has decided they're going to take AIG, which is a ward of the state, uh, public. Keep in mind that AIG got $180 billion from the U.S. government. Why did they need that $180 billion? Because they had issued an insurance product called a credit default swap that would provide insurance to people who bought mortgage-backed securities in case the mortgage-backed security went down in value. So, of course, the mortgage-backed securities went down in value. AIG lost $180 billion in, in their insurance payoffs, and they were gonna go bust. This will be one of those things that will never, ever make sense to me, why we needed to bail out the people who had accepted insurance from AIG, knowing full well they were smart guys that there was massive counterparty risk. But uh, then I see that the Treasury Department has picked, by the way, Goldman was the largest recipient of that, of that money. They received $60 billion uh, in a period, in, in like two wire transfers from the Fed uh, uh, for the counterparty uh, 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 offsets. And so the Fed is picking investment bankers to take AIG public. And who do they pick? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is unbelievable. Come on. I, and, I, yet, and yet we just arrested 170 mobsters in New York. Right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, we had a fine. They don't want the competition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so there's a few other things, but I'll, I'll hand it over to Ken now. Thanks, Ken. Hey.